pulled through this. Uh, emergencies build through the spring months and then um, slow down a bit in the summer months, and then you'll get fall emergencies again. Uh, but the beauty of chronomids is that fish feed on them so much in the spring months that you can actually hang a chronomid in the summertime and, and still catch fish. They, 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 they recognize the food source. And then there's, there's literally 2,500 species of chronomids that have been identified living in rivers and lakes in North America. So, and by far the largest diversity of chronomid species occur in standing or still waters. And so as anglers, what we understand is that they come in different sizes, colors, um, and it's a prolific emergence. So when there's a chronomid hatch occurring, it's just not several thousand pupa emerging, it's hundreds of thousands of them emerging, just like you would see on a, on a tailwater uh, emergence of midges on there. There's lots of them coming off. And they are very nutritious to fish in terms of caloric value. And, you know, it's a fish, it's all about expending the least amount of energy for their food. And uh, there is no easier food to eat than a uh, chronomid, particularly the larva and the pupa stages, simply because they, they can't swim away. They, they can't flee uh, a, fi a fish that's coming up to eat them. So, uh, and, and it's easy, easy food source. And as I mentioned, they're available in the larval, pupa, and adult stages. So if you look at a diet chart uh, in the spring months, you can see uh, the, the, the chronomid, the pupa and the larvae mainly uh, uh, can make up at least 50% of the diet of, of trout. And the, and the remaining diet items are, are the common, typical common food sources, scuds, leeches, down to dragons, boatmen, things like that. Uh, but the chronomid pupa and larvae are predominant. In our waters, um, we do not get good adult chronomid fishing. Um, and it's simply because the trout focus on the larva and more importantly, the pupa, and they gorge on the pupa. And they, so they don't need to come up in the evenings or early morning to feed on egg laying or even emerging adults because that exposes them to more predators, avian predators, um, and then like ospreys and otters, things like that. And so they, they're, they're much more comfortable feeding down low in the water column, right close to the bottom where they're, they're gonna avoid their predators a lot, uh, a lot better. And if you looked at the diet throughout uh, the year, you, uh, the chronomids will still be over 30% of uh, their diet composition because uh, they, they not only, they'll eat the chronomid pupa during the emergencies, but they'll also feed on larvae that are over in winter. They have a one or a two year life cycle. So the larvae are also always available uh, for trout to search out at the bottom of the lake. So as I mentioned, it's the longest still water emergence and uh, they, um, when, when, when there's a hatch going, it's, it's double headers, it's, if there's stream in the boat, it's triple headers. Uh, it, it, it can be a lot of fun, uh, but you have to get dialed into the size and color they're feeding on and the depth that they're feeding on, the depth that the trout are feeding in, uh, on, the, on the pupa in particular. So, you, you, you can do lots of throat samples to uh, see size and color to help you get dialed into what um, exactly the fish are feeding on uh, because there can be multiple hatches, different sizes and colors coming off on the same day. But this is, a, this is what you would see on a good day of a chronomid emergence. There's cast pupil shucks, you know, floating on the water on the surface dome of recently emerged adults and you're catching some healthy uh, rainbows. But it's not restricted just to tr trout that uh, feed on uh, 
chronomids. Um, we have a fairly active kokanee stocking program, and we we stock a number of very fertile small lakes with a small numbers of kokanee uh, well, as well as rainbow. And the kokanee in our lakes can in these small lakes can reach three to four pounds, but they are a superb fighting fish, and actually a two like a two pound kokanee will will take you into your backing. Um, I think they fight so hard because they know if they get landed, they're probably gonna get knocked on the head um, because they're such good eating fish as well. But the kokanee love chronomid larva pupa and as well as brook trout, we have a, uh, an active brook trout stocking program. And so they feed heavily on the chronomid as well. So the life cycle is a complete one, egg, larva, pupa and adult. Their larvae live in tubes at the bottom of the lake, as you can see in the top slide. And uh, they stick their heads out and they feed on detritus, decomposing plant matter. But they don't come out of their tubes and wander around looking for food because they're, they, again, again, they can't escape their uh, uh, predators. So they live in those tubes and they could be in five feet of water, they could be in 55 feet of water, or they could be in 105 feet of water. So those different species will live at uh, great depths in lakes, which allow us to have some pretty creative ways to, to fish the chronomid larva and pupa. And the bottom slide here, the, you can see the, the different colors of the chronomid larva. The predominant colors are maroon or a, a mixture of maroon and green, but you'll get black ones, you'll get brown ones, <clears throat> you'll get solid green ones as well. And they can be quite large. They can reach over an inch, over 25 millimeters in length. Um, so it's a big food item <clears throat> in the larval stage. So here's a throat sample that shows a lot of green chronomid larvae, but mixed in with them are some pupa as well. So this fish was feeding both on the larva as well as the pupa. So again, the, the larvae live at the bottom of the lake in tubes. And um, when the larva is fully developed, it'll seal itself in its little tube and transform into the pupil stage inside that tube at the bottom of the lake in five feet or 105 feet of water. And uh, it takes about 10 to 14 days for that transformation, for that metamorphosis to occur. Uh, into the pupa stage. And then once <clears throat> the pupa is fully matured, it'll break out of the old larval case at the bottom of the lake, a larval tube, and it'll elevate, or rise to the surface of the lake. And um, <clears throat> so if it's, it's happening in 10 feet of water, it might take 20 seconds, 30 seconds for that pupa to get to the surface lake. But if it's, it's happening, if that emergence is happening in 65 feet of water, it might take 15 minutes because it's a slow <clears throat> elevation to the surface of the lake. And to aid their ascent to the surface, the pupa uh, to, um, release gases that build up on the inside of their outer cuticle, which makes the pupa become shiny or silver in appearance. So that gas helps propel the pupa quickly to the surface of the lake. And they're wiggling as they get to the surface. So what you want to note in these two images are how distinct the segmentation is on the abdomen of the, of the pupa, <clears throat> how prominent the white breathing filaments are at the head of the fly, and on the bigger chronomid species, you'll have white breathing filaments at the tip of the abdomen, like these two images show. And then you can see the, um, you'll see the, the, the uh, wing pads of the future adult as well. So uh, really prominent white gills, uh, distinct segmentation, nice slender tapered body. So there's often, as I mentioned before, there's often more than one species of chronids emerging at the same time. And you can have extremely good 
chronomet pupil fishing and not see any hatching. And that's because the pupil will emerge from the old larval tubes and they'll stage at the bottom light for three to five days prior to making that ascent to the surface. And they do that because they've emerged and they're not quite fully developed in, in, in terms of their the, the pupil uh, anatomy. And so they, they complete that transformation outside the tube, but congregated at the bottom of the lake. So, you know, we put down cameras down to 25 feet and, and looked at solid bands of chronomid pupa sitting head up, tail down, a foot off the bottom of the lake. And they're just idling and they're just solid and uh, masses on the so the trout just see that and go whoa this is going to be an easy lunch and they just motor through them and every time they open their mouth and flare the gills they've taken another 10 or more pupa so that's why you can have good fishing and not see the the shucks of the cast that cast uh adults that that have emerged and then and then the pupa they can get quite active wiggling as they uh, wiggling motion as they come up to the water column um, because they're trying to what they're trying to do is free their the adult body from the the the, uh, the skin of the uh, pupa and this because as soon as that pupa gets to the surface of the lake a split forms on the back of its thorax and the adult pops out and flies away it's it's same thing just like it happens on rivers it's the identical uh, process and many, many pupa do emerge from the larval stage with a red butt of uh, a hemoglobin-like uh, substance that they have. And I'll show you some images of that. <clears throat> so the pupa reaches the surface of the lake and the split forms in the back of the thorax. There's the gills of the, of the former pupa and the adult crawls out. And the adults, as we all know, they look like mosquitoes, except they don't have, the females don't have a proboscis. So they, they're a, they're a non-biting midge is basically what they are. Um, and uh, so the, the, the chronomids, once they hatch, they, they head to shore on the riparian areas of the lake. And uh, fertile, you know, mating occurs usually that evening or the next morning. And then the, the fertilized females come back to, to, to the, uh, and, and skim over the surface of the lake, dip the tip of their abdomen in the surface film and release eggs. So if you've ever on a river you, or a lake, you've, uh, you've been there and you'll see these huge thick clusters of chronomids hovering and they look like a big ball, a round ball of uh, chronomids. And what you're looking at is a, is a swarm of male chronomids and the female, and they're releasing pheromones, sex hormones, which attract the females into that swarm of males, and the eggs are fertilized, and then the females leave, and then will lay their eggs usually late in the evening or early in the morning. So that's the life cycle. So back to the chronomid larva. Again, I mentioned typical colors are maroon or mottled maroon and green, shades of green. There'll be brown ones, some black ones, but maroon and green or a combination of two colors are the most common. And we fish them effectively early in the spring prior to the uh, heavy emergences of the pupa. And then again, late in the fall. And of course, because they live at the bottom, we're gonna be sending our patterns as within a foot of the bottom of the lake at all times. Uh, because that's where they're living. So when a trout is feeding on chronomid larvae, they have to swim basically with their bellies on the bottom, tilt their head down, flare their gills and suck the chronomid larvae out of their tube at the bottom of the lake. So when you do a throw pump and you get chronomid larvae, often the water will be very muddy or, or, or colored. And that's because They've inhaled. Uh, they've ingested a bunch of the uh, of the silty uh, substrate that's down there as well. So you know they're right on the bottom. So just be, as I mentioned, they can be these larvae can be in productive lakes, uh, and then they could be this big in the lakes that you fish down there. There's no question. You could tie the pupa on ten two x 
uh, nymph hooks um, because they get that they typically get that large. But a more common size would be tying them on a 14 2x uh, nymph hook. So you can see there, and, and, you know, there a lot of it. These guys aren't happy because we, you know, they're wiggling around out of the water. But both of those larvae there are over an inch in length, so we can we can get pretty creative with bigger larval patterns. Now the pupa, the most common pupa colors are black. <coughs> Excuse me. If I only had one chronomid pupil pattern to fish the whole year. It would be a black body pupa with a red wire, red copper wire, or red holographic flash of a rib and a white bead head. And that would be probably the most common color you see. But there's lots of other colors out there, and the trout are not colorblind and they key in on those different colors. So not only are there black ones, they're brown, green, different shades, all those different shades, maroon, gray. Um, and so there's a wide variety of colors. Um, and again, just like the larva, they can be as small as an eighth of an inch in length to well over an inch in length uh, as in the pupa stage. And when, when they get the, they, when we when they get up to three quarters of an inch in length and beyond, we call them bombers up here. Um, and uh, but as, as I mentioned earlier, you, you want to know that distinct, distinct segmentation in, in the abdomen, the nice tapered body, slender body, the white gills, um, and, and it can be at the tip of the abdomen as well as the head. And, and then you see the wing buds of the future adult. So they're a beautiful little uh, creature, insect, uh, fun to imitate time. You can get very creative on that, that's for sure. So just a few shots of uh, chronomid. As I mentioned, here's a red, some emerge with a red butt. So, so it's pretty pretty common to see the uh, pupa like that. And you know, there, there's an imitation, a red butt brown, we call that a red butt olive brown. Um, uh, but a lot of them come, you pump them, they're, they're, they're chromy in color. We call them chromies or static bags, any, any static bag color combination. And then you could often do a we'll do a throw pump, and you'll see like in this shot here. There's these are 14 kind of a bright green chronomid pupa, and then there's just a few amber cuddler ones in there. And so you you need to be aware of that, that that there's an other there's another color coming off, and they'll switch from eating the green ones to the amber ones. So you're always looking on the water in the water. You carry a little aquarium net so you can dip. Uh, insects out of the water and look at size and color. And then I'll talk how to later about how to properly use a throw pump, which be, is it, be, can be an invaluable aid uh, to, to uh, sample the live food items. And it's a non-lethal sampling tool, but you have to use it properly. And I'll explain that. So just a few more shots. Uh, you can see these are what we call a dull chromie. They're a, a, a dull gray in color and an imitation to represent them. Here's some amber ones that come off. They're beautiful, beautiful insects. And so if you do a throw pump, this is what you'll get. They're all alive. They're all going to emerge in that little vial of water and they're all going to fly away and, and they're going to lay eggs. So, you know, these, these guys are in the throat down the hatch. And they got a, they're they're going to get to reproduce. So, uh, you know, we 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 a throw pump. It, it really does uh, help you uh, narrow down um, size and color. So, just a few more shots here. So, you know, tying chronomid pupil patterns. Um, the smaller ones we typically tie on a a shrimp hook. Uh, Scott hook like a Daiichi 1120 or a Tempco 2499. And on the bigger ones, on the bombers, we'll use a, a nymph hook. I like a Daiichi 1760s or a, a nymph hook that has a slightly curved uh, back to it. So we could be tying them on anything on 14s, 12s, 10s in, in, in the 2x nymph hook. And then on the Scud 
folks were tying them down to uh, uh, 16s. I usually don't tie smaller than the 16. If, and if I want to imitate an 18, I'll just tie a short, a short body on a 16 hook. Because when we start using an 18 scud hook and you're trying to keep that hook in a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pound trout, it's hard. You, 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 they pull out or they end up straightening them and like that. So you want to increase your chances of landing them. Um, just use a one size hook bigger. And all those people have predominant white gills. So we're I using white beads or we're using antron or ostrich hurl uh, to, to imitate uh, the gills. And then we're ribbing, you know, they're, they're, they all have de definite segmentation. So um, we're ribbing them with wires, with flashaboo, uh, with thread. And we're building our bodies. There's such good synthetic materials out there now. And I, like the rage right now is tying with window tint. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a great material. You can because window tint is much more translucent than static any static bag material. So you can vary your body color by by just selecting the color of underbody thread you use and then overlaying it with window tint. Uh, and, and then we we tie a lot of them with thread bodies and uh, even with thread ribs because a lot of times the what we, the chronomet people are what we call dull. They're, they're, they're not shiny. And so we want to imitate a more subdued color. So thread bodies um, uh, uh, work very well. And then we coat our flies if we want them to be a more uh, shinier uh, or mirror like in appearance. We use um, uh, glue like uh, Loctite, or we'll use a, um, a resin uh, and flash it. Uh, with, with, with a, a UV light, UV resins with uh, light, and you can get that shiny appearance to it. So it's, uh, you can get extremely creative. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the crown of people tying part of it is, uh, is a whole, whole new adventure, another adventure besides the fishing. So many, many years ago, when I learned how to fish chronomids, it was with a floating line and long sinking leader because strike indicators had not come on this, they didn't come on the scene until basically about 1980, 1981 up, up in Canada. And uh, so we, we fished either full sinking lines or floating lines and a long leader. So this floating line technique, which we call fishing naked, no indicator, is an extremely effective way to fish lakes, period. And uh, it fishing with a floating line and a long sinking leader and then doing a retrieve teaches you the ability to detect a strike. It gives you that, teaches you that sixth sense that you're getting a bite, which you don't get by fishing with strike indicators all the time because you're, you're just visibly watching. So. Fishing with a floating line naked, it's a great way to fish chronomids, mayflies, damda flies, caddis pupa, uh, leeches, shrimp in shallow water, so or scuds. But wh when we're fishing with fishing floating line naked and chronomids, then we have to use a leader that's at least 25% longer than the depth of water you're anchored in and fishing. Because that you have to allow for the for the leader to slowly sink down, and it's going to be on an angle, so you need that extra leader length. So if I was anchored in 15 feet of water, I would be using a leader at least 20 to 22 feet in length. I, so I'd start out with a 12 or 15 foot long standard tapered leader ending in 4x, and then I would add more 4x, and then I would add. I would add in BC, we use a swivel, a small swivel, and then 20, 24 inches of tippet to the fly. We can't, we're not allowed to use two flies in BC. We're restricted to a single fly, which really sucks uh, because having the ability to use two flies allows you to dial in much, much quicker 
you can keep switching sizes and colors on the two patterns to get dialed in. So um, that's just the way it is in BC. We, we, we're a one fly regulation. I think we're probably the only jurisdiction in North America you can't use multiple flies. Um, but uh, so that's that's the floating line naked technique. So you're I'm anchored in 15. I've got a 22 foot long leader on. I'm casting out as far as I can, and I might be waiting 90 seconds before I start a very slow hand twist retrieve. So what I'm doing is I'm waiting for the fly to sink down within about a foot of the bottom, and then with the retrieve, I'm going to be horizontally moving the fly through the zone where the fish are feeding. And even though the pupa are rising up to the water column, you're presenting the fly in the zone where the fish are and they, they grab it. And, it. and it's in a very, very effective way to fish, but it requires patience. You have to have the patience and casting ability to throw, to cast a long leader, but you need to be able to sit there sometimes three minutes and not touch that fly line, just let it sink. And, and, and if you don't have patience, it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one to master, but it's a great still water fishing technique in general. So with the advent of strike indicators, it made life so much easier to learn how to fish chronomets because with a strike indicator, you can, you can set the depth if I'm in 15 feet of water, I can set it exactly at 14 and a half feet or 14 feet. And I know my fly is suspended off the bottom at that depth. And uh, so you, your fly stays in the zone that the fish are feeding. So re regardless of the depth that you're fishing, it's always, you always want to remember that the fish are going to, 99% of the time are going to be feeding on the pupa within a couple feet of the lake bottom. It's just simply safer for them to eat them when they're down at that depth. Plus they're less mobile then, because as I mentioned earlier, as those people get up, move up through the water column, they get more and more active twitching. Uh, and so they're more densely concentrated close to the bottom. So I could be indicator fishing in say 22 feet of water. I'm hanging down 21 feet. And I know that I know I'm in the zone. And if I if I think I've got the right size and color of pupa on, and I don't get a bite in 15 minutes, and I'm, they're they're hatching around me, I'm not going to change the depth I'm fishing. I'm going to start switching patterns first because it, it's you want to be down closer to the bottom than higher in the water column, unless on your fish finder or your fish or your depth sounder you are seeing fish spread throughout the water column but and that there are days there are days when we could be anchored in 18 feet of water and only hanging seven feet down and that's because the fish for some reason want to eat them higher in the water column that day but rule of thumb is closer to the bottom is always going to be better so we we can use uh indicators up to 25 feet in depth beyond that that's that's a long leader to be casting under an indicator. And so uh, beyond those depths, we typically go to uh, sinking lines. But to make it easier to fish with uh, strike indicators, I, I like to use these indicator leaders, which are 12 feet in length. Uh, the first three feet are, are a quickly tapered heavy butt, and then it runs to straight level 4X, 3X, 5X. Um, and so that that level monofilament sinks quicker than a, a long, normal tapered leader, which has a large, heavy, thicker butt section. So the hang, you want that hang to be vertical as soon as possible. And then using fly lines that are designed uh, with a shorter, heavier head to turn and uh, indicators over and make it easier to cast indicators. So both scientific anglers and real uh, um, uh, certainly have now specialized uh, lines that, that are designed to throw indicators. And it would be the same ones you would use on a river if you're throwing uh, indicators on the river as well. 
And then we often use in our deep water, so we're, say we're fishing 18 feet and beyond. Well, there's a lot of stretch in monofilament. And so to better detect a bite, uh, we'll use 10 to 15 feet of 20 to 30 pound braid. Uh, so there's no stretch in the braid and then a swivel and sometimes a split shot to make it down quicker. Uh, and then your fly or in our case, a single fly. So this is a great way to feed fish increase sensitivity, but it's very challenging to cast because there's no memory in that braid. And so you just want to do roll casts, get it out 25 feet, call it a day. Don't, don't try to be double hauling with this because it's going to get ugly and you're going to have a big mess, a big bird's nest. So there'll be times when the pupa are coming off in 30, 35, 40 feet of water. And that's when we want to use sinking lines to let the line sink, get to the bottom. And then by using a, a steady but slow hand twist retrieve, we bring the chronomid pupa up through potential feeding depths. And so we match the line we use, whether it's an intermediate type two, type three, or a type four to the depth we're fishing. And so say for instance, I was anchored in uh, 28 feet of water, I, I would be using a type three full sinking line. I would cast it out as far as I can with a nine foot leader with my pupa on the end. I would do a countdown to, to uh, get to the, get that fly line down to the bottom because we know it sinks at three inches per second. And then I would initiate a slow but continuous hand twist retrieve. Um, we're not hand, we're not stripping this thing. It's nice and slow, just, just moving it up through the water column. Um, and if you touch bottom partway through your retrieve, then on your next cast, you're going to shorten up your wait time by 15 seconds or so, so that you're just bringing the fly across the bottom and then up through the water column. So it's a, it's a really exciting way to fish because now the fish are seeing a food source that is escaping them. And the, 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 the strikes on a wetline fishing are hard. They'll yank the rod, it's a very aggressive because they're now chasing a fleeing, even though it's not swimming away fast, but it's a fleeing food source. But there'll be times when they're, you're gonna get emergence occurring in much deeper water, 40, 50, 60. I was fishing two days ago in anchored in 67 feet of water and fishing a, an incredible chronomen emergence. And so we call that, that technique re requires a type seven, six or type seven, and it's called deep lining uh, where, or dangling, where we're, we're using that extremely fast sinking line to fish perpendicular straight up in the water column. So we're still fishing. And so we, um, we, we clip a weight to our fly or our pair of human stats and then strip line off the reel, get it down to the bottom, touch bottom, pull in a foot and a half, wind that line on your reel, strip in your line, take off your weight and then flip it back over and then put the rod in a rod holder or hold on to it. So now your fly is suspended a foot and a half off the bottom. And for some reason, when the trout take a fly that's dangled, they pull and they'll pull the rod over the side of the boat if you're not holding on to it. So that's why you hold on to it or put it in a rod hole. But it's a lot of fun. We've got lakes up here that we dangle in 90 feet of water. Um, and it's pretty exciting fishing at that depth. We typically try to only use one anchor uh, because those fish are all over the place and uh, it's, it's a fun way to fish. But this is what you'll get. That strike will literally bend the rod in half as it goes down. And uh, your rod needs to be in a rod holder or it's gone. So we're tying all of our chronomid larva pupil patterns, actually anything in still waters that's subsurface with a non-slip loop knot. It just adds you know, minimum 50% more lifelike action to your fly. And uh, so just if you don't use one in still waters, you should definitely be using a non-slip loop knot in there. It just takes practice to get the loop really small, but you can go on YouTube and watch all kinds of 
of videos on how to, how to tie a, a non-slip root knot. And I'm always using fluorocarbon to, to the fly. I'm not, not a floral leader, but I'll use fluorocarbon from the swivel because I'm using a swivel 24 inches down to the fly. It's just less visible, finer diameter, um, and uh, strong. You can get you get some incredibly four x now or seven and a half pound on on some on the on the new SA uh, uh, fluoro carbon supreme it's, it's really durable stuff so just a few words on your equipment double anchoring is, is paramount uh, when you're fishing out of a boat at in lakes in general but particularly with chronomids because you want a completely stationary non-moving platform there is nothing more challenging and frustrating than having one anchor and then continually changing wind direction. You lose total control over your retrieve, over your presentation. So if you're anchoring in a boat, canoe, pontoon boat, you should have two anchors out. Uh, just you want that non-moving platform. And you need a depth sounder because not only you want to know the depth you're fishing, but you can mark fish on the sounder and know that they're down at the bottom in 40 feet and 30 feet of water. Uh, and, and if they're down at that depth, there's, there's a really good chance it's the right time of year, they're gonna be looking for chronomid pupa. And then you wanna be using a throat pump uh, for different, uh, to, 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 sample, to sample fish to get live food items or recently ingested items are at the bottom of the throat and just before it passes into the gullet or the stomach. So using a throat pump, you can sample live food items in the throat of the fish or at the top of the gullet. So with chronomids, we can track the changing feeding patterns during the day, different sizes and colors coming off. But you want to be sampling a fish greater than 12 to 14 inches simply because an eight or 10 inch fish, uh, the esophagus isn't developed enough to pass the, uh, safely the tube into, into, the, uh, into the esophagus. And you keep the fish in or on the water. This isn't a sampling tool you're going to use with a fish in your net flopping around on the bottom of your boat. You keep the fish in the water and you do the pump safely and release the fish and it's, 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 it's going to live. So the easiest way to handle the fish is to turn them upside down. That calms the fish down and, and uh, hold them behind the pec, gently cradle them behind the pectoral fins. You take your throat pump and you fill it with water and then you squirt all the water out of the bulb so that the uh, outside and inside of the bulb are wet, uh, but there's no water in the bulb. You fully depress the bulb and then you slide the tube until you feel it reach the narrow, the longitudinal muscles in the esophagus. And that'll create a vacuum seal. So you do this slowly, you don't just ram it in there. It's just, just gently push it in and you'll feel it hit and go through the narrowing. And that's the muscles grabbing it. And the bulb will stay depressed. And then you slowly back the tube out and that vacuum seal breaks and the last food items will rush in. So you can see the tube stays, the, the bulb stays deflated, and then you just back it out. So you can do a throat sample and, and you'll get leeches and there's chronomids in there. Uh, so those were all freshly eaten by the fish at the bottom of the esophagus and you're sampling uh, the top of the gullet. You don't want to push that tube in too far because it, then you'll be sampling the stomach and the food items are not going to be alive. It, this is all about trying to get live food items so you know that, that what that fish just, just ate. So this is a typical sample you would get when they're eating bigger chronomid pupa. I couldn't even get any more in the tube because they're jammed in there. And they're all just going, holy moly, I'm, I'm alive still. And you squirt them, push them in, squirt them out, and they're all going to hatch in the adults. 
so just some summary comments on on this uh this this very very important hatch that uh, big fish eat small food items chronomids are they are the most abundant and prolonged of still water hatches and you're always looking on and into the water for signs of emergences so you're looking for you're looking for swallows for gulls for nighthawks that are feeding on on the newly emerged adults and you're looking on the water for shucks drifting by your boat uh and uh, just keep in mind that on a bigger water body there could be a hatch occurring in one part of the lake and not another so you have to be prepared to move and uh potentially locate a hatch that's not occurring in the area that you're fishing and remember in a lot of lakes there's uh deep water emergencies and you got to have patience wait for the hatch typically starts 9 30 10 in the morning builds towards noon early afternoon and then by 2 33 o'clock they start to thin out so that gives you a a four to six hour window to figure out what's going on and and have some great fishing so we'll answer questions but maybe what i should do is uh do the second talk on the, the camelot's area first so i'm gonna so i think i gotta hit a new share correct I think you can just reduce uh, what you have and then go into your next presentation, Brian. Well, if I get kicked out, just let me back in. <laughs> Hang on. We'll let you back in real quick. It'll give us a chance to grab another cocktail. We can see it. So if you just go to slideshow, start from the beginning. There you go. Got it. Okay, so you it's it's showing up now. We're good. Yeah, it looks great. Okay. It looks great. Okay, so just uh 10 minutes on uh Camelot's area. Um so coming coming from Montana, you're actually gonna drive by some really good water in the Kootenays, East Kootenays, some great lake fishing down there. And then and then you're gonna drive more to get to Calmus area. But uh, we've, got, we've got some great lakes in the Calmus area. Basically, we've got a hundred lakes within an hour's drive of town. Uh, I was the regional fisheries biologist here for 30 years. And I my focus was managing still waters. And I had 850 lakes in my region. And in 30 years of working, I never got to all those lakes. I just, it was, you know, spent too much time fighting issues on more accessible lakes. But we have nutrient rich water, a long growing season. Kamloops is a semi arid desert country, uh, sagebrush, cactus in the valley bottoms, and then 10 minutes out of town, you're into Doug Fir uh, uh, zone. Um, so we got a lot of waters to choose from, got a variety of different accesses from road, highway side, uh, to four wheel drive to walk in fisheries. And we've got they're, they're nutrient rich lakes. And we have a pretty good quality management uh, program for quality waters. And we have a regular stocking program, uh, which includes triploids or non reproductive fish. So we've got lakes that you can that are catch and release. We got lakes that are two fish limits, uh, closed in the winter or single barbless bait bands. We've got family fisheries um, and, uh, and certainly we have our share of trophy waters. And access, you know, as I've mentioned, roadside, highway side, uh, but the majority of them are on logging roads, secondary gravel roads that are two wheel drive to the lake or there are obviously four wheel drive ones and there's some hike in ones. And we have provincial recreation sites on many lakes, which provide camping, boat launches, uh, pit toilets, 
and uh, fire pits. Many of those are free camping. The ones that are maintained, which we call enhanced sites, uh, there's an there's a a charge. I, I think it's I think it's fourteen Canadian dollars a night now to stay at an enhanced site. Um, these are all public waters. The, you know they're on Crown land, or and uh, yeah, anybody can go and use them, fish them. So. We, we, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a predominantly a rainbow trout stocking program, uh, but we also stock kokanee and brook trout. And our rainbows are, we, we take eggs from wild fish each spring, rear them in the hatchery for either six months or a year, and then release them into the lakes. So these are, these parents of these rainbows that you see in the two rainbows you see, the, the top left is a panache strain, the bottom right is a blackwater. Their parents were wild, so they, they're not. They are, they, these are, fish aren't contained in a hatchery uh, as brood fish, so they maintain their excellent fighting qualities and. Uh, uh, both of these uh, stranger rainbows are insectivores. They focus on feeding on insects. 99% of the lakes in the Kamloops region are monoculture. We have no, there, there's nothing in them except the trout or char. So there's no forage fish. These are, these are the, these lakes were created by the last receding glaciers, last glaciation. And so they're landlocked uh, or they only have intermittent ephemeral streams coming into them. And so there's no competition for the food uh, that these trout and char are feeding on. So the, the water in these lakes sit, they're like liquid compost boxes. And uh, that's why they're so nutrient rich. And that's why they, are, they can grow up such big fish and, uh, and uh, at prolific growth rates as well. So this is a gorgeous, this is, if I was ever to make a lake, this is the one I, I would design like this, a big deep water area, a nice shallow shoal areas in the middle. And I took this picture out of a helicopter a few years ago. And these are all, this was, this picture was taken in July. And you can see the majority of boats are fishing at the deep water. And nobody, and there's this little trough here that these boats are fishing, but no one's fishing the shoal. If I had flown over this lake on May the 15th, every boat in the picture would have been on the shoals. They would have been all in here. No one would have been in the deep water. And that's just because the water in the spring is cooler. That's where the insect hatches are going. But by July, that shallow water hatches are done. Water's too warm and the fish are in the deeper, hanging around the deeper edges of the drop offs. So we, these, are, these lakes have extensive shoal or shallow areas and they have a deep water refuge and uh, lots of plant life in them, aquatic plant life. Um, and they're alkaline, pH is between eight and 9.2. Uh, so they're extremely alkaline water and they have minimal or low flushing rates. So the water stays in the lake. And we have lots of shrimp in the lakes or scuds, hyalala and gamras, of course, chronomids, calabatus mayflies, damselflies, Caddis flies, big traveling sedges, as well as a smaller uh, rock caddis, um, and then dragonflies, uh, both uh, Lillibulidae, the mud dwellers, or Anax junus, the darners, are, will inhabit both lakes, well, will both be found in the same lake. Water boatmen, back swimmers, and then leeches are, all, are, are found in all the lakes. So it's the same food sources you see in the lakes that you have in Montana, same, same. Um, so choosing the right lake, you know, we, the regulation synopsis identifies all the quality waters because they have reduced limits or are catch and release. They have bait bands on them and they're close to winter fishing and they typically have a single barbless hook restriction. Um, and then you can go online and you look you can go online and find stocking records at gofishbc.com um, who delivers the provincial, the Freshwater Fish Society delivers the provincial stocking program. 
there's map books, there's guidebooks out there. Uh, there's local flying tackle stores that can give information as well. But it's a boat-based fishery. We, I can I can think on one hand the number of lakes you can properly fish from shore. So you need a pontoon boat, you need a float tube, or you, you know the, every what you have up here is John boats. We see, but um, this is the, my boat here. It's a 14-foot John boat. You know a lot of lakes you, you can get around with electric motor. With the bigger lakes you need an outboard, and we do have lakes that have 9.9 uh, .9 horsepower motor restrictions on them so but all that information you can see online on the provincial regulations for each region of the province so gofishbc.com is the website of the, of the freshwater society for the stocking program and there's lots of youtube videos and articles on how to fish fly fish lakes uh, every um gear fish whatever and then you can buy your license online now um so you can do you can get your license even before you make a trip up here and then um, anglersatlas.com uh, uh, you can get uh, contour maps of lakes um and then at, at this website the government website you can also get download the copies of the regulation ops synopsis as well as buying your license um, there's a, a number of fishing resorts that are on small lakes and the BC Fishing Resorts and Outfitters Association uh, has a membership list that you can go online and check out the different resorts. And there's also information on resorts at tourismcamloops.com as well. We do have a fly shop in Kamloops again. We, we had one for many years and then um, we had a big box sporting goods store open up and that that killed that shop, and then they folded. So we have another. We now have a new shop in town, which which has been uh, a breath of fresh air. So for for equipment, you know, we we're using for indicator fishing, dry line fishing, nine and a half to ten foot rods and five six weight. Uh, you can get away with four weights as well, but we do get wind up here, so I like to use five or six weights. And then on my sinking lines, I'm using nine or nine and a half foot rods for the different lines. Remember, you're double anchoring the boat. Remember, you need a depth sounder and then your other aquarium net and troll pump or other essential pieces of equipment. So prime times to fish this area, mid-May to mid-July is when the predominance of the hatches occur, uh, including maize, chronomids, damsels, caddis. Uh, and then another really good time. To, then we get a bit into the summer doldrums where the water warms up. It gets pretty and pretty warm up here. Uh, so you want to leave it, you know, July, mid from mid July on till the middle of September. Um, it can be warm up here, and uh, fishing can be a little more challenging. There, of course, there's always be something happening, but you're far better off waiting until October. October is a golden month up here. Uh, right until freeze up. We have some great fall fishing up here. And as those water temperatures drop in the fall, those fish move shallower and shallower. And so by late October, we're often fishing in five, six, seven feet of water. That's where the grocery store is. And that's where those big fish have to come back to feed in the fall months because they want to bulk up as much as they can before they go into, into winter and to four to five months of ice cover. Um, and so in the fall, it, you, we go back to leeches and damsel shrimp, but blobs, boobies are also effective at that time of year, as they are at, at, in the spring months as well. So there's, I mean, I could list lots of different lakes, but some of the more well-known family fishery lakes around Kamloops, these are all within an hour's drive, you know, uh, Lac Lejeune, Leighton, Tunqua, Knuff, Paul, Campbell, Harmon, uh, White, and then there's quality fisheries. Again, all of these are uh, an hour to an hour and 10 minutes from Kamloops. Um, some are four wheel drive. These are all lakes that you would see in the regulations because they've got quality restrictions on them. Um, there's, there's lots of information online. There's a, a Stillwaters Fly Fishing Forum uh that you can see on facebook and then there's a 
there's a fly fish, uh, fly fish, fly fish BC is a forum, an online forum uh, uh, that you can get information and ask questions about. So there's there, there's lots lots of stuff uh, online now to find out more detailed information. So I'll open it up to questions now. Um, I, we've covered a lot of territory here, and if you've got some something I said that I you didn't understand, then um, you know, fire away. Well, Brian, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Well, um, we have a, a number of questions. You've answered some of them in this last bit, but but, but just to put a little sharper point on it, if you were going to come from Montana for two weeks, what would those two weeks be of the year? Oh, you know, it would be the, it would be May, May 15th to June 1. And, and I'd probably spend a week in the East Kootenays and then come to Kamloops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the reason why I say that is there's some wonderful water in the ferny Cranbrook to Golden area. And those fish are far less pressured than the lakes around Kamloops. So they're easier to fool. They're, they're not hammered. They're not caught and released as many times. So just something to consider. Yep. <laughs> I go down, I go down to the Golden to Cranbrook area every year to fish. I, I just I, I like the lakes down there, and there's far less traffic on them. Well, that, okay, so that brings up a question. I mean, is I mean, there's plenty of there, there's hundreds of lakes to fish, and you know some are the are the better ones. I mean, how crowded is it there? I mean, is it crowded to the point of being irritating? Or is it affecting no, your fishing? No, well, you know, some of our lakes are only 30, 40 acres in size. Some of them only twenty acres. And there might be 15 boats, 20 boats on it, but some of our more popular lakes that have really good chronomen hatches that are a couple 200 to 300 acres in size, they might have on a long weekend, like the Memorial Day weekend, there might be 70 boats on there, but during the week, there will only be 20. So it could be busy on weekends and you know, I, I just be living here. I, you know, I'm spoiled. I don't even fish on weekends. And I, you know, I don't guide on weekends. I just, just avoid them because it's, you know, I'd rather fish during the week when there's less, you know, we just, we just get spoiled. You know, we just want to have a lake to ourselves, but that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> well, so here's another question. So when, um, you mentioned that sometimes, I mean, these pupa gather in the thousands or hundreds of thousands, you know, to stage before they're going to ascend. How, you know, how do you compete with your fly with those thousands and thousands of naturals down there? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's the great question. And <laughs> so, so my rash, my thinking on this is, you know, we always want to try to get as imitative as possible. To the real bugs but you know we're adding a white bead head we're adding a gunmetal gray bead head we're ad adding an orange hot spot to it and we've got a holographic uh flash blue rib so the fly sh it stands out different it's the right size and it's the right shape and it's but it's moving a little bit different and it stands out and they they whack it mm -hmm. so <laughs> you know uh, it's not a, I don't, it's not a, I'm not, it's not my biggest worry that there's lots of naturals down there because our flies stand out a little bit different and they're moving a little bit different and those fish, they eat them. They just, it's just, you know, when you, when you can have 20, 30 fish days, it's just insane fishing, you know, that, that, that they like. <laughs> it's just, your pattern's close enough, it stands out a little bit different and they go, oh, look at that one, I'm going to eat it. <laughs> Well, well. So, how important is it is to get the wiggle? I mean, these these pupa are kind of pulsating and wiggling, and I noticed on some of your flies, there's you know a marabou tail, but most of them are are pretty. There's not a lot of moving materials. It's hard materials. No, 
That's why you're using that loop knot. And if you think about it, if you're fishing with an indicator and there's a chop, uh, just a light riffle on the water, okay, it's going up and down, and, that, and your your fly is wiggling down there. It's very, it's very enticing. Yeah. So, I mean, some I mean, like a Georgetown Lake uh, near us here, yes, um, is a really fertile lake, and it's very very weedy. How do you, and the weeds sometimes, you know, come right up to the surface, you know, later in the year. Um, how, do, how do you fish the uh, midges in weedy lakes? So, like so, you know, we've got lots of lakes where the, the vegetation come, comes up to the surface by, by midsummer. But in the spring months, when the majority of condiment hatches are occurring, or the most dominant hatches are occurring, the weeds haven't grown up yet. Okay. But on lakes that they have, we target the open holes in the weeds, and it's an indicator situation because you've got to plunk the fly down and let it sit there, and you know it's in a weed-free zone. Great. And so, I mean, our electronics, how important are they to success? If you come up there and you don't have any electronics, I mean, how are you going to do? Well, then you need you need to have at least your anchor ropes marked every five feet so you know the depth. And then you're always going to be, if you're indicator fishing, you're always going to be using a weight or a pair of hemostats to find out where you are. You know, you're going to clip it to your fly, drop it down, and your indicator is two feet under the surface when it hits the bottom. Well, you know you're two feet off the bottom, so you've got to shorten it. You've got to lengthen up your leader and get you down closer. Well, great. Um, oh, somebody mentioned white that they've fished White Swan Lake. Are you familiar with that lake? Oh yeah, I've spent a few days on it. Yeah. Is it is that a trophy lake or? Well, it it used to be, but the management has changed on the lake where, um, because it's in a provincial park, the park is trying to rely on natural recruitment instead of stocking it, which means you lose control over the population. So, you know, in the perfect world, if you're a fisheries manager wanting to manage a lake, you, the water body is landlocked, you put X amount of fish in to get X size fish. And if you want bigger fish, you put smaller numbers in, but when you add natural recruitment, you have no control over what's coming out of the creek. And so what's happening in White Swan right now is the size of the fish is, are getting smaller than what they, it's still a gorgeous lake to fish, but the last I've heard in, in the last couple of years is the size is, is, is down a bit. It's still a wonderful fishery, but it's you're not going to go to White Swan now and catch three and five pound fish all day long. It, it, I, I'm pretty sure of that. So, well, so if you go to one of these trophy lakes that are managed, you know, for for bigger fish, yes. and you're a decent fisherman and you happen to be there, you know, sometime, you know, the last couple of weeks in May. Uh, what can you expect to catch in terms of numbers and size? I mean, how, how big are the, what's going to be the kind of the modal fish? What's going to be your big fish of the day yeah. and the big fish of the week? So, I mean, so, you know, realistically, if you're fishing a trophy lake within an hour's drive of, or a quality managed lake within an hour's drive of Kamloops, you should expect to catch fish in the three to four and a half, maybe five pound range with the potential to catch a fish in, in double digits. But in, even though these lakes are super productive, you know, we, we're only stocking smaller numbers of fish to get the big guys. So the one thing you have to remember about managing about a lake and you, every when you stock a lake year after year for 75 years you 
those fish crop the food sources down and it's it's kind of like you know if you're a farmer and you're growing your crops it's always nice to be able to leave a field fallow for a year or two and then mm -hmm. replant it uh, you know that would be a great idea on lakes because the, what we're seeing is you know these even though these are super productive waters um, we're dealing with changing well it, it all start a lot of it goes towards our weather patterns our climate is changing and it's affecting bug life in the lake then you compound it with continually stocking these lakes uh, that you know sometimes it has an impact on the food sources so you know in my mind a quality fish is uh, anything over three three and a half pounds and uh, we've got lakes here that you could get into 10 15 of those in a day or you might only catch four or five of them in a day but you're going to catch a whole bunch of two to three pound fish and then you never know when you're going to hook a really big fish nice what what about um uh i mean are there how often are there dry fly opportunities so we have some lakes where you'll get dry adult calabatas fishing and adult caddis fishing um but the, they're not we don't have a lot of lakes that have good caddis fishing in lately and that's simply because again it's you know they're they're they, the continual stocking has cropped them off a lot and some of our best still waters are also irrigation impoundments um mm. we're ranching country here and so what we've learned over the years is the constant fluctuating water levels during the summer months where the lakes are pulled down has had a long-term impact on caddis populations. So we can still get caddis fishing and there certainly are some good ones, but it's not on every lake. Uh, that's just that's just the way it is right now. Do you have the traveling sedge up there? Yes, yes. And damselfly hatches? Yes, and we have damsels. Some, some lakes are really good down to fly lakes and uh, it all depends on the water chemistry and the amount of uh, emergent like long stem bulrush cattails mm. I don't really like that that dictates how healthy the, the, the down to flies are. Okay, I've, I've got kind of a fisheries management question here um, in Montana. Um, it, it seems that our lakes are really kind of managed really kind of put and take here. You know, we don't manage their winter fishing is allowed. You know, there's a standard limit. You know, I mean, they're not managed as trophy lakes. Um, and I, do you have any advice on how we can work with FWP to designate lakes like that? Or is that just politics? You would, you know, the the philosophy of the provincial fisheries program is to provide a diversity of angling experiences and 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 to the regional fisheries biologists that means because we've got whether it's rivers or lakes but, but particularly lakes when you have a large number of lakes to manage you 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 can afford to provide a yeah quality lakes for that segment of the population of anglers that want that angling experience so you know to me it's i don't know it's it's a no-brainer when i moved to Kamloops in 1974 to become the biologist here we did not have a quality lake and within five years we had 70 of them because we needed them there was a demand for them and they're still 750 other lakes that they can you know, uh -huh. do so so you know we've got 70 or 80 quality managed waters and uh it you know it, it just we we didn't make them fly fishing only they're single barbless artificial lures bait band so you can still go out with your spinning rod 
and and your and your spoons or spinners or uh, other lures and and catch fish and if it's a two fish limit or a one fish limit you can still kill you can still kill a fish but but we've you know everybody's playing by the same rules and you have a choice you can go to that lake or you can go to a lake five minutes away and where it's a five fish limit and you can kill your five every day so yeah it's just well yeah yeah in, in montana here we have a lot more as you mentioned at the beginning you know we have a lot more rivers miles of rivers than we do numbers of lakes so that's kind of a problem for management yeah. you've got a embarrassment of riches there now uh a one final question someone asked do you have any hexagenia there uh only at the outlets of some some of them large large lakes uh they're not in the small lakes they're in the silty habitat at typically at the outlet of uh basically a handful of lakes uh and uh they're not that common unfortunately we just we just we don't have the good habitat for them is that an early June hatch or May hatch? Uh, up, I would say it's more during the first two weeks of June is when you would see them. Um, honestly, that, you know, the closest one I can think is is over two and a half hours away from Kamloops. So we we just don't have those large water bodies. We, yeah, we we got lots of small ones. <laughs> Gosh, well, I'll t I'll t um, Brian, this has just been a fantastic presentation, and for everybody that's on, um, this is we've recorded this. We're going to put it on the website, and Brian is going to share his um, his powerpoints on our website too. So with those, you'll be able to get. Uh, you know, be able to, to look at it again, soak up that information, get the addresses and websites of, of the different uh, uh, places that he mentioned. And uh, uh, it just really fantastic. I learned a lot. I got to get over to your area. I've been postponing it for 45 years. It's time to do it. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, we, the last two years, we haven't been able to see our, our American friends come up uh, yeah. to fish. And uh, But this is a year that, you know, things are getting back to a bit more normality. And hopefully, uh, yeah, you, some of you will be able, to, if, if you're interested, this is a good year to come back up and fish. Well, what we should do, and I, I bet uh, Bill Rudiger is on the call. I bet he agreed to this. We need to put together a fish out where a dozen of us or so go up there and spend a week. Uh, it sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, and to everybody else too, um, uh, Google Brian Chan fly fishing. That will take you to, uh, you'll find his uh, site there. It has, um, you know, uh, midge patterns. It has specialized equipment and uh, techniques and, and other things. So uh, it's, it's well worth a visit and uh, you can give Brian a little business there too. So um, I, I, I wanna thank you again, Brian, really nice job and uh, appreciate it. Yep, thanks again, uh, Mark, for the invite. And uh, I hope everybody has a great uh, fishing season. And uh, I envy you guys having the rivers down there, that's for sure. <laughs> well, let's do a trade out. You come down here, I'll take you fishing, <laughs> and you take me fishing up there. <laughs> take care, everyone. Thank, thank thanks, you. everybody, and thank thanks you. for joining. Bye. Have a good night. Yeah, good night.